All right. Uh, good evening once again. Um, well, this is uh, I'm Ahmed Aruz um, talking to you uh, from Sri Lanka Institute of Marketing. Uh, today um, we are having uh, the third round of uh, the experience sharing forum. Um, we have um, a, a renowned speaker today. I think most of you are familiar with uh, this gentleman who's, who's going to talk us through a very relevant and an important topic uh, that is for, for us marketers. So um, today we have in the uh, experience sharing forum. Uh, this is of course organized by the Sri Lanka Institute of Marketing. Um, the, we've been doing it as, as part of our mandate uh, to uh, support the uh, economic prosperity of Sri Lanka. Um, we, this is the third round, so we're having an interesting topic today. Uh, the topic of capital markets and green bonds. Uh, we from a marketer's uh, frame of reference point. So to take us through this topic, to share his expertise view today, we have uh, someone um, who's really um, you know suitable to uh, take us through this topic. And uh, let me introduce uh, this gentleman uh, who is um, also the director, uh, chief executive officer of, of uh, First Capital Holdings PLC. He is an experienced professional with a career spanning over 25 years, uh, comprising diversified expertise in financial services, including banking, treasury and investment management, capital market strategy and corporate finance advisory services. Uh, having joined First Capital in 2003, uh, he steered the company uh, uh, to a full service investment institution, holding license as a primary uh, dealer in the government securities, stock brokering as a full trading member of uh, Columbo Stock Exchange, unit trust management and wealth management licensed by uh, SEC. Uh, and um, he uh, spearheaded the information of the key debt restructuring uh, uh, deal with internationally based development financial institution as well as signing of strategic partnership with foreign institutions focusing on emerging markets such as Sri Lanka. Um, he was the former general manager of SoftLogic Capital PLC. Um, he is um, also the um, he specializes in asset and liability risk management, having secured the accolade of leading and representing two Sri Lankan companies in winning the International Bank Asset and Liability Competition organized by uh, annually by the Netherlands Development Finance Company, German Investment Corporation and uh, Propaco, a subsidiary of the um, uh, AFD. He is the um, uh, uh, Mr. Dilshan Virasekara uh, is an alumnus of uh, INSEAD, having successfully completed his executive professional education at INSEAD Business School uh, in France. is also uh, alumnus of uh, AOTS, Tokyo, Japan, and um, he is also the director of uh, Colombo Stock Exchange. So uh, we would like to warmly welcome uh, Mr. Dilshan um, Virasekara to uh, take us through the topics of uh, topic of the ESF today. Dilshan, uh, we warmly welcome you to the forum this evening. Uh, thank you, Ahmad, and a very good evening to everyone who's joined us uh, this evening. Uh, so I'm going to talk on the subject of capital markets, green bonds, but also to make it a little bit relevant from a marketing perspective um, and see how uh, enhancing your knowledge, uh, enhancing um, investing in these sectors could really help Sri Lanka to emerge from the current crisis that we face. Um, all of you, please do excuse me. I have a little bit of a cough and a sore throat, so I might from time to time take a little break, uh, but hopefully we can get through uh, this presentation um, fairly soon. Uh, I think I, what I would like to do is really put it in context, so I'll share some slides. Uh, speak a little bit about, about my experience um, and talk us through uh, how maybe you marketers can really help the country emerge from the current crisis. Um, I think we have a question and answer session thereafter, so I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have uh, and you can, I believe, post them through the chat or directly uh, to the organizers uh, who will take it up at the end of the session. So um, just let me share my screen and I hope you guys will be able to see it. <clears throat> um, is my screen visible, Muhammad? Yeah, yeah. That, right, that's great. that's visible, Dishan. Yeah, yeah. 
All right, so uh, capital markets and green bonds have uh, been a sort of a hot topic um, in international markets. However, not so much in a Sri Lankan context of it. Uh, so let's try and get a basic understanding of what capital markets and green bonds entail and then see how relevant they are uh, to help us through this predicament. Uh, in terms of capital markets, essentially what is implied by capital markets is a place where uh, capital formation occurs. Um, that could be in form of stocks, bonds, currencies or any other financial asset and a marketplace where essentially brings uh, the investors and the issuers together is generally referred to a capital market. Uh, from a Sri Lankan context, this entails two elements. You have fixed income uh, securities that could be issued in capital markets and you have uh, equity related investments that could be. Uh, both listed and unlisted could form part of this uh, and this is what is generally referred to uh, the capital market space. Uh, unfortunately, in Sri Lanka, uh, we've been lagging behind, not both from a world perspective, but even from a regional perspective uh, of not really developing our capital markets to the extent that some of uh, the regional players have done so and done so very successfully, uh, thereby attracting a lot of capital or foreign direct investment. Uh, into the country. So I think it's 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 important to understand why that has happened. Um, so traditionally, uh, Sri Lankans are a, uh, are a nation of savers. Um, we all know we have a 22 million population, uh, a bankable population of about 15 million. So if you take over 18 year olds who have a bank account and we have probably 100 percent penetration in terms of banking. Um, so Sri Lankans are very used to that banking. Um, everyone probably has a current account, a savings account. Anyone who's, who's earning definitely has one. Uh, and that has been the preferred mode uh, of saving or investing uh, for the public of Sri Lanka. Now, unfortunately, uh, that isn't a very efficient way of directing those savings or investments to sectors of the economy that require them. Um, so what do we do? We'll just uh, take an example how we currently operate. Uh, if you look at the savings base of the country, um, it's dominated by essentially uh, three institutions or three product classes, uh, and they're all predominantly in the fixed income space. Um, so you have government securities, which are mm, treasury bills and bonds. Um, that are essentially issued by the government of Sri Lanka. They are considered to be uh, risk free or free of default. Uh, we can argue on that or debate on that given the current context, but yet rupee securities are. Uh, and this is roughly about a 12 trillion rupee market. So there, are, there is about 12 trillion rupees of um, treasury bills and bonds out there that have been issued uh, that the public and other institutions have invested. Um, if you look at the dynamics of who's invested in it, you would find out that it's predominantly institutional investors. So approximately about 40% of these uh, issued securities are with the Employees Provident Fund. Um, that's essentially the money that uh, we all essentially park aside from our salaries in terms of EPF contribution. Uh, that totals to something like a three and a half trillion number, uh, almost four trillion number, and that is all almost all of it is parked in government securities. Then you have uh, institutional investors, insurance companies, uh, other private provident funds, banks, um, NBFIs that may have mandatory statutory requirements also investing in these securities. So that's a 12 trillion market. Then you have the banks who offer various deposit products or savings products. You could have fixed deposits, savings accounts, current accounts, uh, certificates of deposits, uh, different instruments that banks would offer their clients. And uh, generally, um, again, that uh, collective uh, total amounts to around a similar number, about 11 trillion of um, deposits are held with banks. Then you have the smaller finance companies that account for about one and a half, two trillion. Um, corporate debt instruments that have been issued privately uh, for about another maybe one or two trillion. And then you have a stock market, the Colombo Stock Exchange, 
which currently has a market cap of about three and a half trillion. So you have about roughly 32 trillion rupees of financial assets or savings of the public and institutions um, that are, you know, directed through um, uh, these instruments to the various sectors. So the government is taking almost, um, I would say, about 40 percent of it. The banks are taking another 40 percent of it. And then you have the finance companies and equity related issuances and everyone else accounting for the balance 20 percent. Now, uh, unfortunately, um, this direction in terms of the money raised being channeled is not, in my opinion, being efficiently utilized in the economy. Um, because we all know, obviously, the government takes that money that they raise and is spent on various uh, public uh, spending uh, or budget financing means that has not been productive. And we know that, right? So these assets are not really generating positive returns from a government perspective. Then you have the banks who obviously again are taking your depositors money and in turn lending that, giving that out in terms of loans. Um, and how do banks do this? They take a fair thick margin. We all know if you go and place a deposit. Um, today, currently you could get as close as 20 percent uh, on your deposits. But if you go to take a loan, um, it's probably going to be in the region of about 26 plus percent. So the banks are sitting on a five, six percent interest margin um, that they are currently using to direct those funds to sectors uh, or people who want to borrow it. Um, and normally, and I think all of you would agree, if you go to and talk to a bank and try to get a loan, they will ask you what is the collateral? What is the security that you're giving? So again, it's a costly affair. And the point that I want to make is that the funds such mobilized aren't efficiently being directed to sectors of the economy. It is being directed to sectors that the banks deem as suitable based on their risk appetite, based on the fact that they don't want to lose the money that they've lent to anyone, uh, based on the fact that they are taking collateral. But there may be very well other more um, uh, reliable, efficient uh, businesses that need this capital directed uh, that could actually contribute far more positive, positively to the economy. Um, so unfortunately, that has been an issue in this country and that's where capital markets can really play a part. Uh, so understanding capital markets, understanding how it works and effectively investing in capital markets, I believe can help resolve this issue of uh, what, what we face today, where, where the funds that such that are saved through these different products are not efficiently directed to the sectors that most need it. So capital markets generally, what capital markets do is for capital markets do something called financial disintermediation. Banks intermediate. They take deposits, keep a margin and give out loans. Capital markets generally is a more efficient way of putting the investor who has that cash or the saver directly with the person who needs the cash. And it's done at a far more efficient pace, not at that five, six percent margin, maybe at a half a percent margin that gives a better return to the investor and a cheaper rate of borrowing even for the issuer. And that's why capital markets are important because it is a way of efficiently directing the capital or the savings in the economy to sectors that are productive, right? So I think it's very important that the general public understand how capital markets work, understand the products and services, understand the alternatives that are there to today's conventional banking um, products and maybe start using them for two reasons. A, to enhance your returns and to get better returns than what you are getting and two, to direct cheaper funds to the sectors of the economy that are productive and that can take that funds and use it efficiently and thereby help growth. And unfortunately, that has been a fundamental issue uh, that has uh, impacted this country and why we find ourselves in such a situation as of today. So just setting the context for this uh, context for this uh, conversation and taking it forward from there. Very quickly, you have 
the dynamics of capital markets offer, offers you a whole set of different products. You can have unit trust, bank deposits, government securities, listed and unlisted debt in instruments, equities, and even private equity and debt. Uh, and I very broadly categorized in terms of risk uh, and the investment period, uh, how these sort of stack up. So obviously, uh, you know, when you go down this ladder, it's a higher risk, but also a higher reward. Uh, and the uh, tenors for each of these investments could differ. So these are some of the alternatives. I put bank deposits in there as well, but you can see there are a lot of other alternatives that are available for everyone to choose from. Um, so, I mean, it's important to also understand what an investment is. I don't think Sri Lankans really consider investment. We sort of talk of savings. We don't talk of investments. And I think that's a mindset change we need to uh, to make because if you go to any part of the world any part of the developed world even if you go to the regional india bangladesh that have far more advanced markets people make investments people don't save in banks um, and that's why those economies are doing uh, fairly uh, better than what we are in sri lanka so just to understand context investment is an asset that you acquire with the goal of generating income or either appreciating in value and one fundamental thing to remember is that the responsibility is always always with the investor. So you have to do the due diligence when you choose what you put your money in. It's always with you. Um, and that's a mindset change that we Sri Lankans need to make. Um, a few basics when you look at making investment decisions and very quickly talk you through that. Um, I think identifying your own Capacity for investment is important. So looking at um, how you allocate your excess funds over what you are spending. Uh, and essentially, I think it's important to always uh, allocate some part of your income for investment prior to consumption. A lot of us do it the reverse, that we say, okay, we'll consume and what's left over, we will invest. But I think that's a wrong approach. I think the approach should be you choose what you want to invest uh, and what your investment goal is, and then look what you're left with to consume or spend uh, and that's again a mindset change i think sri lankan needs to uh, sri lankans need to have um, then you need to sort of identify your invest investment horizon uh, look at the goal why are you why what are you saving up for um, is it to buy a new house is it to buy a new car is it for your uh, kids wedding is it for uh, any any other purpose so set a timeline and evaluate that timeline and then choose the instrument that is most suitable for you and then look at the risk appetite that you would have. Are you prepared to lose some part of your money uh, when you make that investment? Or are you saying, no, I cannot lose anything. I need a guaranteed return based on which again you can choose those different assets uh, that are out there. So I think this three step approach is a very, very simple approach that anyone can do on their own and select um, your investment objectives. Uh, I'm not going to talk you through all these slides. I will share this presentation with the Institute and the Institute can share it with the membership. So I'm just quickly going to breeze through what government securities are. Like we said, we said these are securities issued by the government and perceived to be free of default, free of risk. We also call them gilt or gold securities because um, it is uh, assumed that the government can keep printing money to repay its debt obligation. So they will never run out of cash because they'll keep printing and pay you back. Um, so that's government securities. You also have other listed debt instruments. These are could be issued by corporates who are already listed on the exchange, or it could be even a corporate who is not listed issuing, however, listed debt. Again, you have a company issuing an instrument and the investor is picking it. These are very straightforward uh, fixed income instruments, uh, maybe issued at par value or discounted value and having a coupon uh, that will pay you periodic interest. Um, unlisted debt instruments are also there. Uh, what is illustrated here is an example of what is called a securitization, uh, where uh, certain assets are put in backing those investments or backing those papers via our trust. So again, just illustrating what that securitization structure looks like. This gives you some recourse to collateral in case of a default. Uh, so again, um, just types of instruments. We'll come to equities very fast. Uh, next to fixed income, obviously, you can also uh, invest in equity, uh, which is a share of a company. Um, so if you take essentially the net assets of the company divided by the number of shares, that one share, share is what we essentially refer to as a, uh, as, a as an equity holding uh, that anyone can invest. 
you have about 295 companies listed on the Columbus Stock Exchange, starting from you know, large conglomerates like John Keyes to maybe even smaller companies that are listed on uh, a newly formed SME board. Um, these are companies having maybe capital of even as low as 50 million, but um, investors can uh, invest in these shares um, and then you take equity, uh, equity risk or equity stake uh, of that company. Uh, and the returns you enjoy could be twofold. It could be in form of dividends or profits that these companies distribute uh, with those shareholders, or it could be a capital appreciation of the share price going up um, and something that you bought at maybe we'll say 10 rupees in a year's time, 15 rupees uh, and a capital gain uh, potentially that you can make from the fluctuation of the share price. But do please remember that there is risk in equity investments because there is no guarantee of that share price going up. It can also come down. Uh, so you must be prepared to even take losses if you are an investor looking at uh, equity investments. Um, I'm not going to run you through um, primary market, secondary market. Uh, I'll just quickly sort of um, uh, focus on certain elements that you need to look at when you make any investment decision. So I think whether you're investing in a country facing a crisis or not, uh, there are certain factors that you need to consider, you need to evaluate, you need to do your homework on before you make this investment decision. So I think uh, looking at the macroeconomic factors is one, looking at policy outlook is one, interest rates, equity outlook, um, looking at certain sectors and how they will perform, uh, right? We all know currently the export sector is doing very well. Uh, exports are growing, have grown to a record pace, uh, 1.2 billion last month, about a 20% uh, year on year growth. Uh, and the only silver lining really for Sri Lanka in today's context has been the export sector. So this, these companies are doing well again. So pick your sector before you invest. Um, within that sector, look for the stars, look for the companies that are doing better than others. Um, some level of financial analysis is needed, so you need to go into the financial statements. If it's a public listed company, um, that information is freely available via the Columbus Stock Exchange. Um, and you can do simple valuations that can uh, tell you whether this share is overpriced or underpriced. Um, you need to look at your individual risk appetite, like I said before, the period that you're investing. And I think very importantly, um, timing the buy and sell. Um, one thing I'll mention here, uh, a lot of people in Sri Lanka are driven on investment based on sentiment, not based on fundamentals. And therein lies a big problem. So everyone follows the herd. We call it a herd mentality. When you see the market going up, appreciating in value in 2021 we uh, we had the best performing stock exchange in the world it went up 80 percent for the year uh, and there was huge interest everyone rushed in to buy everyone put their money in the stock market and when it peaked and thereafter it started coming down people are selling now to me i think you could have a more measured approach uh, you see you don't buy at highs you really sell at highs, you buy at lows. Um, that is a fundamental trading strategy that any seasoned in investor will tell you. So sometimes when it looks very bleak, when markets are not performing, when markets have declined, today we are sitting in a market that has declined 40% for the year. Now may be a good time to invest, not when the market has peaked and overheated at 80%. So timing your buy and sell is also of, of critical importance and that's something um, that I would urge everyone to uh, look at. Um, again, high the risk, high the reward. We know that. Um, I'm not really going to breeze through uh, stock selection processes and how you analyze. So I'm going to you know, consider the time we have and sort of allocate more time um, for question and answers. But also, I think when you invest in shares, especially, uh, you need to consider your investment objectives. So there are shares that are sort of income shares, keep giving you steady dividends, right? Irrespective of economic cycles, these sort of perform well. Then you have value shares, undervalued for whatever reason. There's been a sell-off or the company has suddenly started earning, but people don't look at it. Um, low valuations, low PEs, again, uh, value shares. Then you have growth shares. They may be growing at a faster pace than the industry or the sector. Um, so huge upside potential, maybe five years down the line. Uh, you can play that. 
uh, then you have cyclical shares that sort of move with economic cycles uh, do well during high growth years don't do well in low growth years um, you could choose them or you could choose defensive shares that would hold value uh, irrespective of economic cycle so there are again diff different type of shares that you need to sort of consider i just quickly want to talk to you about now uh, how certain marketing initiatives or certain product initiatives have impacted certain shares uh, to give you a flavor of um, uh, sort of you know from a marketing perspective uh, what to look out for how to identify these stars uh, and what you can do so i think a story that you all probably know is selling insurance i've just picked up with some stats here uh, selling insurance somewhere in 2007 8 um, sort of rolled out this uh, vip uh, you know your paid cash then and there on 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 your claim um, and it was a big hype. It was a revolution in the industry. No one had done it. I think no one had really done it even uh, um, worldwide. Uh, the claims were paid immediately. If you recall those old nice ads that we used to see, you know, someone on a bike comes, you met with an accident, assessors take a photo, pays you cash. Now that caught on to such an extent. And I think the marketing fraternity played a big part to really publicize this, that everyone moved. I know even those days I moved personally to Selinko because it was such a economy. You had a big hassle of making a claim and they revolutionized the way it was. Now someone who saw that and someone who studied and how they priced the product, right? They priced, they priced it premium. So they, they are, their premium for an insurance policy was one and a half times more expensive than the industry average. But still people, people paid that price because they saw convenience. Now, just look how the share price has reacted during the period, those two, three years that they grew selling VIP, right? The share price was 31 rupees. It went up to 1,600 rupees. So now if you were smart enough to identify that this product is really going to take off, that this product is really going to be taken up, uh, you would have probably bought the share. And you see those in their results of profitability also. Um, so again, another case study really of how a, a revolutionized product, uh, a very, uh, very innovative product can be a game changer, uh, not just in terms of the company, uh, their market share and all that, but also from an investor perspective to re reap the rewards. Uh, another good example is Watawala plantations. However, this took a much longer period of time. So again, here Watawala turned away from tea and rubber to palm oil. They did that back in 2012. Um, and uh, uh, obviously it takes time for the palm trees to grow and you to be able to harvest it. But someone who foresaw that would have sort of seen that over the next six years that they would have started reaping um, the um, benefits of moving to palm oil and palm oil, oil prices also in that uh, 2019 2021 just went up went off the roof so again a good nice case study that you know six rupee share uh, went up to 174 but again if someone had done that analysis looked at uh, demand look the fact that they moved away from tea rubber into palm oil and that that uh, the price escalation happened would have uh, predicted that the share price also would sort of react again um, not really a marketing story but more on the product uh, uh, innovation side of story uh, primal gas again a pretty similar started uh, expanding uh, the only glass manufacturer in the country started expanding capacity uh, and did well through that. So that's an example. And we all know, I think we're all familiar with the later story, Expo Lanka. I don't know. I think most of us would have heard that. So if you look at Expo Lanka in the early part of uh, 2020, you could have bought that share at two rupees and 50 cents. Um, and they invested heavily in freight. Uh, the pandemic resulted in freight rates skyrocketing, growing 10x. Uh, and them really reaping the rewards. Of course, subsequently we've seen market corrections happen, but essentially if you bought the share at two rupees and 50 cents, the peak was around 400 rupees. Um, and that's uh, sort of uh, phenomenal, um, phenomenal uh, sort of 200x 
200 times return on your investment over a very, very short period. So again, um, you know, um, examples of how how focusing, knowing investment, studying, looking at the marketing trends, looking at uh, different things would sort of uh, reap rewards in the future. So just wanted to give that flavor to you guys. I'm not going to talk, talk you through business cycles, stock behavior. Uh, we have a little bit more to cover. Um, so again, one point I wanted to make, um, which a lot of investors sort of make a wrong call on. Um, uh, when there's blood on the streets, you you get scared. So you invested in equity markets, we'll say last year, you're probably sitting on a 40% negative return right now, and you're cringing, you're, you're scared, oh, what am I going to do? I've lost 40% of my value. You know, the best, some of the best investments come averaging out. And uh, when the saying goes that when there's blood on, on the streets, even if that blood is yours, your own, average out buy, right? Uh, that has been a strategy that I think if you talk to any investor, you know, the likes of Warren Buffett or whoever else or the big funds like BackRock, you will see that is the trading strategy that they adapt. They buy when markets are down, markets are cheap, Shares are fundamentally lower, um, so that's a that's a that's a lesson I feel we as Sri Lankans need uh, to move away from that herd mentality of doing what everyone else does, and spotting opportunity uh, even in adversity is something that I just want to sort of throw out there for consideration. Um, very quickly, green bonds. I think you guys were expecting me to cover something of that. Um, again, why I'm covering this two subjects of capital markets and green bonds. I think we can really push these to um, today from a Sri Lankan context to attract investments that will actually solve a lot of our problems that the country is facing. So green bonds are typically fixed income instruments that have been raised where the money is exclusively used for climate environmental purposes. Now we all know Sri Lanka is facing a power, power crisis right uh, we are currently dealing with three three and a half hour power cuts we've dealt with 10 hour power cuts a couple of months ago and we all know how frustrating that is but the sad thing today is we live in a country that on 95 percent of the time has sunshine um, and we fail to harness this free energy right due to various short-sighted um uh policies that you know government or whoever has brought in over the years um, so green bonds could always be a way to overcome this situation so a big argument that people make <coughs> is that uh, renewable energy is very expensive or at least expensive to uh, generate and start up uh, we know in our country we have about <coughs> currently i think it's about 50 55 percent hydro um, and most of the rest is really coming out of uh, diesel or coal power generation. Uh, in the peak season, we can go up to about 60-65% hydro when our reservoirs are full, uh, but solar remains still a very, very smaller component. And um, a big problem is that people don't have the cash to invest to put up the panels to convert into solar. So, I mean, if you look at a normal household, I think it will cost you about 1.5 million rupees or maybe 2 million maximum to generate the electric electricity required for that household via solar. Uh, now, maybe every Sri Lankan household can't afford that. Maybe some of us can, but maybe not all of us. Now, if there was a way to issue green bonds, raise that cash at fairly reasonable levels and utilize that to put these panels on every roof in a Sri Lankan household. Imagine how we overcome the situation. So again, I think creating awareness and uh, knowing what these green bonds, how they work, and then helping market that is something the marketing fraternity can sort of help the players with, whether that's banks or renewal, renewable energy firms looking to raise that. So that's why I thought it's important to bring this context. And this can solve a big part of our problems because energy needs has been a critical issue that the country is facing, be it um, power or even be it from a fuel perspective, right? Um, so that's why this is so important. Again, just the illustration of what are el el the eligible products that qualify 
for green bonds, almost everything does. So whether it's water conservation, um, climate resilient infrastructure, waste pollution, uh, bioenergy, um, sustainable agriculture or forestry, you know, everything, um, urban transportation, all of them qualify. So you can actually issue instruments that fall to this and essentially there is a huge initiative. There's a huge global market that is looking to invest in instruments that are compliant to these requirements. So that's also something that we really need to look at. Um, so very quickly, I think I have about probably five, ten more minutes um, and I should be able to finish. Uh, I thought to talk a little bit about certain specifics that we all, all, uh, all us Sri Lankans can do. Of something that I'm also trying to inculcate in the institutes that I uh, am involved with and sort of make a, a culture shift uh, or a mindset change um, in everyone. And I think Sri Lanka needs that to come out of the current situation that we are faced with. Um, so if you look at FDIs, I think a big issue is that we are not getting enough of investment into the country, right? And there are three sort of reasons hindered around that. And I think we can fix most of that. So one is that you have a stable government, a stable political environment uh, that has favorable legislation, goodwill, uh, stability um, that allows foreign investors to come in. Um, and I think we can very soon get to that place. So we've had a lot of turmoil, we know, uh, but however, we now have you know, government in place. Hopefully, uh, even though I know a lot of people will argue with me saying this is not what we want, uh, that's OK. I think we will have our say maybe uh, in a couple of months time when we go for elections um, and we can do the change. But right now we need stability, right? Um, so I'm hoping that with the changes we've seen, we can have that political stability that will encourage foreign investors to come in. Second thing I think we already have uh, geographic location. So we know that if you look at FDIs, there's a big incentive that countries who have access to the ocean and as, uh, access uh, logistically access uh, are better placed. And Sri Lanka obviously is one of the best placed countries in that sense. Um, so again, we don't have a problem there. Then after that, you need sort of consistent policies that don't change, that include tax policies that promote investment and are not changed every year. Unfortunately, we've been a country. If you just take the last five years, we've changed our tax policies thrice over, three times over, and that's not good at all. So we need some level of consistency, and I'm hoping um, with the latest amendments that will come through, uh, we've already raised our taxes quite significantly. We may have to raise them a little bit more, uh, but we leave them uh, as they are, and those are left so that businesses know that these are the consistent costs that will hit us. So I think these three elements are pretty critical. Then coming to a mindset of what's really needed from Sri Lanka. And I think um, I want to just speak on these six things that I think are quite critical uh, and can change um, the way we, way we think, way we do things. And it starts off with having a positive mindset. You know, it's it's pretty depressing. Uh, and I've seen, I, I know all of us like to harp on all the bad things that are happening, all the issues that we have, uh, all the challenges we face. Just look at social media today. What are people doing? 90% of Sri Lankans are complaining, right? And to me, I think the fundamental change, if we want to see a change, is your own, your own mindset. Change your mindset. So if I just take a look at today's papers, headlines, right? I can find uh, negative headlines. I can find positive headlines. Right? So I'll tell the first negative headline that everyone probably looks at. You take the daily FT today and it says 90% of our total population depend on handouts. How depressing is that? Right, you see that and you go into a shell and you start off your day in a bad way. But there are so many positives, right? Uh, the president says IMF will sign by end of August. Tea is at a record high. Exports have grown 20%. Diesel prices have been reduced by 10 rupees. 
uh, port city is under the spotlight of World City Summit in Singapore. Uh, sports boost tourism for July, 21% increase uh, month on month on tourist arrivals. Um, uh, gas prices to be reduced. So, I mean, again, it's your mindset, it's perception, right? So, I think we sh as Sri Lankans need to look at the good things we have. Yes, I know it's very challenging. I know we are faced with a lot of uh, troubles, um, but if you focus on the positives, I think that will help uh, in also in your act and how you what you do um, sort of change. So that is very important and I think marketers can do a lot to change this mindset of the general public of Sri Lankans um, so that we see positive headlines, we see positive things. So sell the positivity and don't sell the negativity is one thing I want to say. Second, learn. We are we are always sort of very critical on things. We look at others and we are easy. We, we love, love to criticize. Find fault with something. Why not learn? Why not try to read and learn something that you don't know and see how you can apply um, that to your work? So I think uh, that whole learning aspect is something a lot of Sri Lankans put aside after they complete their professional education and you think you ought to know it all. Um, every day there is something to learn and I think having an open mind um, will make you sort of absorb a lot more information and that will help you. Innovate or improve. Second, right? You don't always have to innovate. Do something new, but that's all right. Um, sometimes people tell me, look, it's tough to come up with a new concept, a new idea. Yes. Why not look at an existing idea and see how you can improve? Japan was built after World War II on improving stuff. They never innovated anything, right? The world's largest uh, automobile manufacturer, Toyota. What did Mr. Toyota do? He went to Ford Motors and he learned day two, he said, of what Ford was doing and came and replicated it in a cheaper, more efficient way, right? What did uh, Panasonic do? Again, went to the US, learned electronics, came back, did it. So if you can't innovate, improve, right? Look at what you have and see how you can change that. Focus, focus and focus, right? Focus on your goal. Dream big, go big, otherwise go home, right? I think Sri Lanka has had enough of mediocrity, enough of small business. We really need to dream big and do big. Um, so again, a message I think to me from me to the marketers, uh, you know, sky's the limit, right? Focus and go big on whatever that you sort of want to do. Um, empower, take risk. Uh, we are, like I said earlier, a nation of savers, I called you. Uh, what that means is we are not risk takers. We are very conventional in thought as Sri Lankans. Uh, we play safe at everything we do, we don't take risk. And entrepreneurship is about risk taking, right? And that's why some of the other parts are some of the other countries um, in other parts of the world are doing better than us because they are taught at a very young age to take risk and taking risk and making losses or falling and um, failing is not an issue. You get up and you start again. Unfortunately, our curriculum in schools don't teach that. Uh, and that's something I think we need to do to empower people, empower your kids, empower your workers, your employees, let them take risk. And even if they fail, that's OK. Let it be a learning and move on. And next, obviously, lobby, 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 lobby the politicians, lobby for the change that you want. Use your connections, use your network. I think the marketers probably have one of the biggest networks in the country. Um, lobby for the changes that you want. Don't forget. Um, I will leave with this message. I think we are an example to the world. No one has spoken of what this Aragale or these protests have achieved. You know, I have not seen one headline. The only country in the world to peacefully demonstrate with no big issues. I know we had some riots. We had a couple of loss of lives, but not like the Arab Spring Revolution, not like anything else that the world has seen peaceful revolution that kicked out the cabinet chain, the prime minister chain, the president of the country. Tell me another country that has done that. No one, right? Why don't we market that? Why don't we showcase that this is 
probably the greatest democracy really that's out there. Why don't we market that? And maybe if we do all of that, uh, I think Sri Lanka can, can come out of the glut that is. So with that message, I will stop now, Ahmed, and um, we can take on any questions that there may be. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, Dishan. Uh, it's it's in, indeed, uh, I mean, very interesting uh, conversation to listen to. I think the last bit uh, is really, uh, I think what, what is really, uh, I think I wanted to get a start on. Um, the capital markets and green bonds is, of course, uh, is what we wanted to discuss. But in the end, uh, that you kind of wrapped up everything what you discussed in the earlier slides. Now, um, like uh, the first question I would like to start with is, uh, generally, Adeshan, you know, this topic of, uh, you know, capital markets and marketing are not discussed together. Uh, you know, if um, you've been you've been in a lot of marketing forums, I mean, uh, I remember we working together in brand excellence. Now, I, I want to start off with that. You know, it, it is we always looked at things in a very uh, in, a, in a silo, in a secluded manner. We thought, OK, marketers role is to advertise, communicate. The finance guy's role is to really look at the uh, revenue or the return or the profits. I mean, um, what's your thought in it? I mean, is that an, isn't is it that the right time for us to take that perspective as marketing, taking the whole responsibility of uh, return and, and profits and revenue, not just the, uh, the surface of what we do? Of course. How do you really? Totally. Yeah, totally. So I think, uh, you know, capital markets, unfortunately, um, haven't utilized the marketing expertise or talent uh, available because everyone considered this a fairly niche market. Um, a lot of people didn't see appeal to the masses um, and, um, you know, people thought investment banking or capital markets is more for the uh, affluent or high net worth sort of higher deal size, not really for the typical Sri Lankan, which is not the case. And uh, something that I've been trying to always advocate is uh, we should leverage marketing. We should use marketing to create awareness so that people know what is out there. What are the alternatives? Now, for example, if you take government securities, government securities for a long time offered a higher rate than bank deposits. And on the uh, risk scale, ranks higher, lower risk. Um, so why wouldn't anyone pick something giving you a higher return with a lower risk over something else just because you don't know about it, right? Um, and I think uh, capital market, the industry has realized this. And today with the advent of social media and, you know, everything else happening around, I see all these companies that are involved in capital markets using marketers, using marketing, using social media, that space, to create that awareness and I think if we can do that uh, the public one get you know educated they know about it but also then they channel those investments that will then flow back to sectors of the economy that really need it and are productive and utilize it for growth uh, as opposed to what happens now or has happened in the past so for sure um, but I think um, a lot can lot more can be done but I'm seeing that journey uh, sort of go ahead. Uh, I, I was all a capital, uh, always a capital market player. You know, I didn't know nothing about marketing. I actually learned quite a bit working with you guys on brand excellence and sitting on the panels, which sort of helped me realize, wow, you know, here is a tool that is underutilized in my industry uh, that Absolutely. that can be leveraged upon. So I'm I'm really uh, I'm really advocate of using that, and uh, personally, I've been doing it. And I hope the other players in the market also uh, effectively use the talent that we have because the talent is immense. Um, and, uh, the marketing talent we have in this country is great. So it's a shame if we don't utilize it. Absolutely. Th thank you. I think that's a message to most of the marketers. We need uh, the capital markets need the expertise of marketing and therefore uh, try and leverage that talent. Uh, just moving on to a, uh, on the same lines, but in slightly different angle to the conversation, uh, Dishan. Um, you discussed about the importance of importance of looking at uh, this this structure or this market uh, from an investment angle, and uh, you touched upon saying that we as Sri Lankans always have this habit, and we spoke speak about the habit of saving, but not really the investment. Now I think uh, when it comes to uh, corporates and when it comes to the marketing bosses, I would say uh, it's always been the focus is still. How do we reduce uh, marketing budget? How do we save? How can we reduce cost? 
um it's never been on the on the roi perspective uh, so how do we i mean how, because marketers i mean i'm a marketer and i've also been on the other side of the table i understand that this has been a challenge uh, always the pressure is to save cost to cut down cost now how can marketers really tackle this challenge what do you, what's your perspective because i think the right way to go about is how much of return we can kind of get to the spends that we have rather than really cutting sure. down the cost sure. Yeah. So what's so your advice I, I on that? That's a, that's a very, very tough one. And I think uh, sometimes we are faced with that situation also. The current context of um, the economic crisis and maybe financial implications of that on companies could be a bit of a drag in the short term. Um, so uh, you may find companies saying, look, I'm not going to spend as much as I did last year. We are having a crisis. I'll rather, you know, uh, say, save that and give some incentive to my employees or do something else or do CSR, um, which is fine, but I think that's a very short term phenomenon, right? I would advise marketers in terms of pitching it, if you're going to pitch it, so you really need to pitch long term value. You see, if you go to a CEO and you're pitching it or to the C chief marketing officer or CEO, you see, you're not doing a pitch on a campaign. You should never think of it as that. You should be giving a pitch on a long term investment uh, that will give you a ROI of X. Right, so you need to illustrate right. that. So it's not about a campaign. It's about how a campaign builds your brand value, right? Enhances the brand value, creates top of mind recall, gives you a customer pull and gives you benefits that could be perpetual in nature, not just over the uh, the campaign period. Because you see, when you build brand loyalty, brand loyalty will repeat giving you business whether you run a campaign or not, right? Yeah. So that that can only be done on investment. So I think, uh, you know, I, I've come across some smart marketing guys who've really given that message out and made sort of me realize. So yes, uh, I know it's a challenge when it comes to um, dealing with marketing heads or CEOs, always looking at cutting costs. Where can you reduce? Uh, how, how can you cut costs? But I think uh, the question that you need to ask them back is, you know, do you just want a short term result or do you want a long term? So do you want to just win the battle or do you want to win the war? Uh, and if you ask that question, I think a lot of CEOs and C CMOs will say, I'll rather win the war than just win this battle. Uh, Absolutely. So that's something. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a very strong point uh, that you really touched upon. Uh, marketing, uh, I think we, we need to always uh, evolve as marketers, not being very tactical, not being very, uh, I think I think the ability to take out the strategic uh, perspective in marketing and try to see how can you be uh, marketing help the organization to become more strategic so that there is a competitive advantage behind all your uh, initiatives. So on that, um, you know, why I asked you is that you also specifically mentioned, because I'm trying to draw a reference between the two, you said that, when turmoil, when when the markets are low is where you need to really invest. Uh, and then uh, the opposite of it is what really happens when when things are really low, nobody wants to get into it. But there is a similarity between marketing and capital market in that sense, because in uh, challenging times, if you invest behind brand loyalty, I, I'm, I think we marketers like to believe that that will stay stick in people's mind when things are getting better, that will always have an impact. Um, so I think that that is was I was really trying to understand with that question. I think you really brought out the answer. Focus on the war, not just the battle. Uh, so great, uh, great message out there. So I have a question. Um, this is from Sanat. So the question is uh, investing in shares is somewhat a gamble. As you said that the investment should be considered when uh, there is bond, uh, there is blood on the street. However, it may uh, take a considerable time to recover and uh, would hinge on that macroeconomic factors. Hence, uh, the pickup may be prolonged. How would you assess investing in shares as opposed to depositing it even at low rate, especially when the future appears to be bleak? Sure. So I think, again, uh, my comment was not a general comment to invest in any share. Uh, like I said, I think you have to pick your stocks, right? So I'm not making a comment to say invest in shares uh, on, from overall uh, perspective. I'm saying pick your stocks. Look at stocks that are fundamentally good, are still not hindered by the economic crisis, maybe even doing better in the economic crisis. I'll give you an example. If you were an exporter, 
uh, and your exports are also growing, you've already got a 80% bump up on your PNL just by the currency depreciation, right? So if you look at some of the mm -hmm. earnings of exports companies coming out, you see they are reporting 70, 80% more than what they reported the previous quarters, right? Purely on the exchange purely on the exchange depreciation. So what my message is to sort of pick stocks. Secondly, I think the question is asking, OK, but when you have fixed income at 25 percent, do I really want to take a gamble, uh, a chance? Because yes, there is no guarantee of the share price appreciating, right? That's un unknown. So should I rather take a 25 percent guaranteed return or go for something? I don't know what that return would be. Right. So again, like I said, different that answer. You have to really look and ask within and see whether that fits you or not. Uh, a, a thing to consider would be uh, I'll ask a question. Do you know what inflation is? Right. So inflation just last month touched 60 percent. Right. So technically, if you are investing in an instrument at 25 percent in with a very short term, right, we'll say you put a three months FD. And inflation is going at 50, 60 percent. What is your real rate of return? Your negative in terms of real returns, right? So therein lies maybe you know, a possibility that there may be shares that are undervalued to that extent that could significantly correct. So today's valuations of the Columbus Stock Exchange are at historical lows, never before seen prices. Our market is trading at a five times or less than five times price earnings multiple and uh, less than one time book value, right? Regional markets are trading 15 times price earnings, maybe one and a half times book value, right? So pick your stock. There are undervalued stocks, right? Obviously, I don't want to comment on what they are, my opinion of stocks, because I don't want to be held liable that someone else would come and later make an issue or a claim <laughs> on Slim saying, you know, this guy came and said this stock is undervalued. So I won't, I'll refrain from quoting uh, any, any share, but uh, you may find that shares actually are a way to preserve your wealth uh, because they may actually outperform even inflation over the medium term. Again, share investments are not short term investments. A lot of people come into this with a very trading mindset. I'll buy a share today, I'll sell it tomorrow, I'll make a quick buck. Uh, I'm not asking people to uh, speculatively trade in shares. I'm asking you to invest. <coughs> Look at fundamentally lower valued stocks that are trading below what they should be really trading. Look at are they still unhindered? Are they still doing well? Are their prospects good? And pick those stocks. And I believe if you do pick the stocks, that those will outperform uh, even fixed income at times. Uh, yes, there is no guarantee. There is more risk, uh, but that's why there is a higher prop return also. So 25% on fixed income, you can maybe make 100% on equity. We don't know. So again, you have to assess that and do it, Ahmed, but uh, it's not a blind call to buy shares and not invest in fixed income. It's to pick your stocks and consider it as part of the investments from a long term perspective. Yeah, listening to you, uh, Dishan, reminds me of uh, how similar the approach when it comes to marketing or investing in capital markets. Uh, it all comes down to the insights you have, isn't it? I mean, uh, in marketing, your biggest win is how close you could get to that, you know, most untapped consumer insight. And and looks like, you know, it's the same with capital markets. It's the more informed you are, uh, the more insights you have and, and your ability to kind of uh, probe and foresee uh, what's out there might uh, make you a winner. Uh, so I think um, I think on 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 that context, the importance of uh, like even in in the capital markets in Sri Lanka or in the context of marketing, uh, do you see we are doing enough in terms of really uh, taking data, uh, taking analytics, uh, the insights kind of an approach, or can we really improve uh, and and should we really uh, work along that, those lines as yeah, a as so a I, fraternity? I, I, I would I wouldn't be the best to comment on that, Ahmed. I'm not, okay. like I said, I'm not a marketer, so I don't know to what extent data um, is used, but uh, definitely it should be. Yeah, I think a lot of 
decision making should be data driven uh, and not just blind on that's why i said even you know if you take capital markets a lot of people or the stock market a lot of people invest on sentiment not on fundamentals they they neglect the fundamentals so my thing is i think yes even for marketing it should be research based it should be data driven uh, you should have facts and figures that um, validate uh, a decision that you are going to take uh, and that is always a better approach than uh, sort of let your gut feel um, tell you what to do so for sure my yeah. thing is because i would prefer if i go to a marketer and say come up with a campaign or come up with a, a concept or a idea i would want them to come and say look we've done data we have this and here's proof of why this will work before i sort of embark on that so very much i agree that it should be done yeah so i i actually wanted to take this as a leading question to something else into the capital markets which is like you know uh, there is a no uh, i think it's a it's a myth or I, I don't know how do you really call it it's a notion that you know uh, really identifying this you know breaking this complex clutter out there in the capital market it's a lot of numbers a lot of information i'm not the right person so i have to rely on uh, an expert to tell me where to invest is is that true i mean is it is it not uh, not, not really not really it's it's not rocket science it is not definitely not rocket science it's a uh, simple math simple numbers being able to read a financial statement and analyze a financial statement uh, i could teach that to a 10th grader in a couple of hours time so i don't think it's rocket science i think marketers are smart enough to be able to do that but if you don't have the time uh, if you are not confident enough to do it it's always good to have an investment advisor uh, who can help you in that journey or take a easy approach to investing in capital markets via what we call unit trusts or mutual funds um, these are you know uh, uh, vehicles that pool client funds and you have a qualified respected knowledgeable fund manager deploying that capital uh, in the best possible way that they think so if you think i don't have the time or don't have the knowledge to do this you could always rely uh on um uh, a fund manager to do that for you that is also an option but uh, like i said it's not rocket science i think uh, people over complicate things in sri lanka and there is a perception again so i think mindset it's all about mindset yeah. uh, it's something you any, anyone can learn yeah dishan just i think you being also the uh, very closely associated with the stock exchange what type of a platform or, or uh, tools that it's available for for the layman i mean the normal person to go and learn or study about this whole trade or the capital markets i would i would advise everyone to download uh, the csc app um you can download it on google or apple absolutely free of charge um that gives you insight into lot of information it has uh, the daily um, fluctuations that take place you can even open an account via that itself seamlessly without any face to face interaction with uh, a broker or having to fill forms ekyc e onboarding um and you can start your investment journey uh, either with a investment advisor who will talk to you and advise you or doing your own research so the app itself really has a lot of research material has technical graphs uh, you could request your broker to give you online trading terminal um, that you can sort of use to play around and figure out with my advice is if you're starting off with the game start off with a small number um, i mean if your intention is we'll say to invest a million rupees i would say you start off playing with maybe 50000 first and see how it goes and maybe when you come to some level of maturity that you can maybe put in a little bit more money um so there's a lot of material out there to read ahmed and uh, i think books that uh, experts have written uh, people far more knowledgeable than me uh, who have written and, and coached people into investing in equity um so but again my my thing is not just investing in equity i think invest in capital markets so if you are not the type of person who wants to take risk look at fixed income i mean today at 25 30% on government securities uh, that's a pretty pretty decent return right uh, i did say about inflation but inflation may be temporary so you may want to pick a longer term 5e instrument and inflation might taper down in 6 7 months time uh, that uh, then you're sitting on a very high yielding asset that is giving you a very nice income uh, so there's a lot of material out there um but if it's a quick thing you want to please do download the csc mobile app um that i think is a good place to start 
uh, and then build your competency. And once you have that confidence, uh, I mean, then maybe you can take uh, a little bit more risk. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dishan. I think um, we have a few questions, but I think uh, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, pretty interesting. I mean, my last question I wanted to ask you, which you've already answered, uh, what is the marketer's role in today's context? Uh, you very uh, nicely captured that in the, your last slide. Uh, I think the strong message out there is be positive. Uh, do what's best you can do. Um, I think in that context, uh, thank, thanking you very much for your time and, and for all the information and the perspectives that you shared in today. Uh, I would also like to um, uh, mention uh, the kind of work that was done behind this uh, experience sharing forum was uh, by the SLIM uh, membership team. A big thank you goes out to the Sri Lankan Sri Marketing membership team uh, headed by Chamil and also the president uh, of Sri Lankan Sri Marketing uh, the Council and the Executive Committee of Sri Lankan Sri Marketing and uh, CEO and the staff of SLIM for uh, bringing this to you and putting all this information and the knowledge together. So uh, looking forward to see you uh, in another uh, similar episode um, sometime soon. Until then, all of you have a pleasant week ahead until we see you again. Thank you. Thank you.